Hey everyone, it's Radish. I know it's been a while, but I finished the Pacific Crest Trail around the middle of September, and I was able to spend a couple days in Seattle with my Tramley, uh, the same one I finished with. And after that, it's been a crazy two months since then, I flew back to Cleveland to see my parents, um, drove to Indianapolis where Justin and the cats were living, and I spent like two weeks there, and then the first week of October, we did our second road trip out west this year, because uh, we moved all of our stuff from Indianapolis to Portland, Oregon, where we are right now in our new apartment here. So, it's been a crazy two months, but now that I'm settled in and I have a new job, it's time to get back into hiking and exploring the mountains. So today, I thought while the trail was still relatively fresh in my mind, I would go through all of my gear that I used on the Pacific Crest Trail and talk about what worked, what didn't work, what I would do differently in the future so that you guys could get a breakdown. And all of the gear that I'll be talking about today is included on my lighter pack link, which you'll find in the description of the video below. So you can find out the specific brand names of everything, if I forget to mention them on here, um, their weights, how much they cost, everything like that. So we'll split this video segment up into three sections, just like I did before the trek. So if you haven't watched my introductory gear videos, you can check them out right up here, but we'll split them up. So the first of three videos is gonna be talking about my sleep and my cook systems. The second of the three videos is gonna talk about my pack, my clothing and my electronics. And then the third and final of my gear review videos is gonna be over everything else. So the miscellaneous things, the uh, hygiene and first aid kits, and then the gear that I needed specifically for the Sierra Nevadas. So first up, let's talk about my sleep system. So the shelter that I used was a Big Agnes Copper Spur HVUL1, the 2020 model, and I absolutely loved it. It worked fantastic for me. Granted, for probably 90% of the through hike, I just cowboy camped, um, didn't really need a shelter, but it was really, really crucial for like the first three weeks of the trail in the desert when we were getting rained on and snowed on and having 10 feet of snow dumped on us at times on like San Jacinto and in the Big Bear Mountains. Um, this shelter really did a fantastic job withstanding storms and especially those high San Santa Ana winds in the desert. I was with a couple of friends. Um, if you guys remember mom, her tent actually collapsed on her in the desert. She had the uh, Big Agnes tire wall. And I think the pole structure of the copper spur uh, really just lends itself well to high winds and storms. Uh, I felt super secure in that tent, whereas uh, sometimes other hikers in uh, non-freestanding tents like the Z-Pax Duplex did have them collapse in the middle of the night, especially in storms that could put you in a bad situation. So for myself, I would not do anything differently with that shelter. I would carry that again. Uh, I found the one person tent did have plenty of room for me. Uh, it had some nice storage to keep everything that I wanted to organize inside my tent, inside of my tent. Um, it did develop a couple like pinholes in, not in the rain fly, but in the inner wall and in the like bug mesh. I don't know what caused it, honestly. I think it might've been ants. The ants in the desert um, in some places in Northern California were super like aggressive. And I think they might've just been chewing on my tent in the middle of the night, but it was nothing that just um, uh, repair tape couldn't fix. So this tent lasted me the entire through hike and I still have it and I'm gonna still continue to use it. Next up is the sleeping pad that I used. So this was the Thermarest Neo Air x Lite. Uh, the inflatable pad. I loved this sleeping pad. I'm a side sleeper and I toss and turn a lot. And I think if either of those two things apply to you, uh, you should definitely invest in an inflatable pad, especially if you have a down bag. I find that down sleeping bags, since they compress underneath you, they don't give you any extra padding. Um, so like when I had a synthetic bag back when I did uh, the Holt route in Switzerland or the Annapurna circuit in Nepal, I was fine with the closed cell foam accordion style sleeping pad because synthetic bags gave me a good amount of like cushion underneath so I couldn't really feel the floor. But with my new down bag that I got for the PCT, that just was not enough. I could not have a good night's sleep at all. So with the inflatable pad, 
I found myself getting fantastic night's sleep. Uh, the noise that people sometimes are worried about, it sounds kind of like a potato chip bag. Myself, I got used to it, so I didn't wake myself up by tossing and turning. Um, it's just the mylar um, insulating blankets on the inside of the sleeping pad that make that crinkly noise when you move a lot. Granted, if you end up sleeping in a campsite with a lot of other through hikers at the time, it can be kind of annoying, at least for people that aren't you. Uh, but most people carry a set of earplugs, and so they can pretty much drown out the sound that way. So I stored my sleeping pad inside of the pump sack because I thought that would help protect it from any abrasion. And I didn't get any leaks in it, so maybe it did. Um, now in the beginning, I was actually blowing up my sleeping pad every night with that pump sack because I was worried about mold growing in the sleeping pad if I were to just directly blow into it. And then I just got really lazy and about halfway through the trek, I started just blowing directly into it to inflate it at night because it was a lot faster and a lot easier. Um, I haven't noticed any type of growth inside of the sleeping pad. Stay tuned. Um, but I would still bring the pump sack as well, at least for a protective stuff sack for your sleeping pad. I did end up developing a manufacturer's defect in my sleeping pad uh, like three weeks into the trail around Big Bear. Uh, I was shifting my weight on the sleeping pad in the middle of the night and I heard a huge pop <laughs> and it was terrifying. And I heard uh, mom from the other tent uh, <laughs> kind of groan. It's like, oh no, what's happening? Uh, and it turns out one of the baffles that kind of like direct the airflow in there blew. And so there's a slight bulge in the sleeping pad, which was fine. It wasn't too bad. But the next night, another baffle blew. And the next night, another baffle blew and so on and so on for uh, about a week until there was just a huge mound in the center of my sleeping pad. And I had to either sleep with my back super arched or I had to sleep half off of it and use that um, bulge as a kind of built-in pillow. Needless to say, not great night sleeps, especially because I was uh, sleeping on snowpack for most of that time up in the Big Bear Mountains. But the company Thermarest was fantastic to work with. I just explained what happened uh, and they shipped me a brand new sleeping pad to Wrightwood. They were able to work with me while I was on trail. Um, and I haven't had any issues at all with the new sleeping pad. It still retains air perfectly well. So I would be using the same sleeping pad again if I were to redo the PCT. For my sleeping bag, I had the REI Men's Magma 15 degree down bag. Uh, it was the regular length, so I believe that's 72 inches long. For the vast majority of the PCT, this was the perfect bag. It was a great warmth to weight ratio. Um, I liked having a neck baffle that would kind of like prevent airflow in and out of my sleeping bag. And it kept me warm for the vast majority of the trail. There were only two times that I ended up getting kind of scary cold. One was in the desert um, up on San Jacinto and up on the Big Bear Mountains when we got caught in those horrible winter storm systems. Um, I believe it got down to about 17 that night. So it was testing my bag for sure and pushing it to the limit. For those instances, I honestly wish that I had a zero degree bag. But for the rest of the trail, the 15 degree bag was totally fine. So my advice would be if you're starting when I did in the middle of March, you gotta be ready for that winter weather in the desert. And I would recommend bringing a zero degree bag. If it's not within your budget to have a zero degree bag and then swapping out after, you know, you get into like mid April or whatever for a 15 degree bag, um, then I would recommend just sticking with a 15 degree bag throughout the whole trail and maybe bring either a sleeping bag liner or a reservoir that you can fill with boiling water in the middle of the night and stick inside of your tow box just to keep you warm if it does get scary cold in the middle of the night. But if you carry a zero degree bag in the beginning of the trail, it will definitely be way too hot by the time you get to Northern California and Oregon and you'll not be having a good time with that. I was honestly surprised that I didn't get super cold up in the Sierra Nevadas because I did enter them super early uh, in like mid-May. Um, there were some nights that it was it was definitely cold, but I was never painfully cold like I was in the desert in those first couple weeks. So for me, my 15 degree bag worked fine in the Sierra Nevadas um, and all the way through Washington as well. Uh, at the end of the trail, it definitely started getting cold again, but it was never 
painfully cold, like those first couple of weeks in the desert. So the 15 degree bag would work fine for all the rest of that. So myself, I tend to sleep cold. Uh, I would bring the same bag again, but again, if I also had a zero degree bag that I could swap out with, I would have done that for the first couple of weeks. Now I also carried that Thermolite uh, compact reactor sleeping bag liner. Uh, it was supposed to give me about 20 degrees of added insulation. It definitely did not. It probably kept me a little bit warmer, but honestly, the insulation I think is negligible. Uh, the main thing it did was it was cozy. It was nice having like the feeling of sleeping with a blanket rather than um, that very like synthetic sleeping bag material feeling on your skin, especially when you're sweaty at the end of the day. It's nice to feel like you have an actual soft blanket. Um, but it was also just super easy when I got to all the resupply towns to throw my sleeping bag liner in the wash or wash that in a sink rather than try to wash my down sleeping bag. Uh, I didn't have to wash my down sleeping bag at all during the trail. I just did it in Seattle when we finished the trail. So with that alone, for me, I really enjoyed having that with me. Um, it was also nice at the end of the desert section and in Northern California, sometimes it didn't really cool off at night and I would just sleep on top of my sleeping bag. Um, but I, I always need a blanket on me to sleep. That's just how I work. So I would sleep inside of my sleeping bag liner, at least so I felt like I had a blanket on top of me. So for me, I would again carry the same sleeping bag liner. Uh, it wasn't super critical. It was definitely uh, what you would call a luxury item. The pillow that I was using was the Sea to Summit Aeros Premium Inflatable Pillow. I love that thing. I had never used an inflatable pillow backpacking before. I always just kind of crumpled up some of my clothes and put them under my head. But because I wasn't carrying any extra clothes this time, that wasn't really an option. And because I was gonna be out there for six months, I wanted something a little bit more comfortable. So I went with this pillow because it has that kind of like soft plush coating. So I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was sleeping on like a plastic inflatable sack, um, like some of the other camping pillows. I think this pillow is fantastic. It didn't really slip and slide on my sleeping pad like the plastic ones did because I think it had that fabric coating on it. Um, it lasted me the entire time, honestly, until I got to Seattle when I threw it in the wash to try to clean it and I think the interior lining melted and now it's kind of deformed and it has like all these different bubbles in it where like air actually flows into it. It was definitely not usable for another trip, but that was probably my own fault. Um, I would definitely get another one and use it on future backpacking trips. And the last item in my sleeping setup is the very essential pee bottle. Uh, you can use whatever bottle you want. I just happen to use a Gatorade bottle, um, but I carried it with me the entire trek and I would do it again. There's nothing like uh, camping on 10 feet of snow, having to pee in the middle of the night when it is 17 degrees out and uh, having to go outside and do that yourself, especially when your socks and your shoes are either soaking wet or completely frozen and you can't even put them on your feet. So for me, carrying around a pee bottle for your tent is an essential. All right, so that does it for my whole sleeping setup. Uh, if y'all have any questions, feel free to comment below and ask them. I'll try to respond to them all. Uh, but next up, I have my cook system. So the first item in that is going to be my water filtration unit, which was the Sawyer Squeeze. By far and away the most common filtration system you'll see on the PCT or on most through hikes. Um, this worked perfectly for me. I threaded it onto a dirty smart water bottle that I would always have like dirty water in or at least available to put dirty water in. And then I would filter it out into a clean smart water bottle that I'd keep on my shoulder strap. Uh, and then I would mark them with Sharpie so I could make sure I knew the difference between a dirty and a clean water bottle. Um, but the Sawyer worked really, really well. It did definitely slow in flow rate throughout the trail. So I'd have to backflush it probably once a week. Um, I would just put it on like my to-do list when I got into trail towns to just go to a sink, back flush it, hammer it on the sink a little bit, shake it out, pound it, uh, and it got a lot of sediment out. It never got up fully to what it was when it was brand new, but I mean, that's to be expected. You're pumping hundreds, if not thousands of liters of water through it over the course of six months. Um, I would definitely use the same filter again. Uh, the only thing that I'd be interested to try in the future and let me know if any of y'all have used this. Um, the Katahdin Be Free filter 
it works really similar to the Sawyer Squeeze. Just a, it seems like it's more of a modern design. Um, I saw some people using them on the PCT. Uh, so that'd be something I'd be interested in maybe trying out on a shorter hike before I would commit to that for such a long through hike again. Uh, but the Sawyer Squeeze was a fantastic option. I feel safe using that again. Um, you just gotta make sure on those cold nights you do put it in your sleeping bag so it doesn't freeze and the ice busts open the uh, the little like porous membrane. Um, but other than that, it was a really good filter and I would recommend it. The water reservoir that I used was the Hydropack collapsible four liter bladder. This bladder really worked for me. Um, the cool thing about it is that it's heat resistant so I could boil water pour it in there and then tuck that bladder in the foot box of my sleeping bag, which I did frequently in the first couple weeks of the trail when we were getting snowed on. Um, so it worked great for that. And it had capacity to, you know, carry water on some of the longer dry stretches. I would totally use this again, especially if I thought it was gonna be cold out and I was gonna have to boil water because a lot of the other reservoir bags that you'll see out there aren't compatible with boiling water and they'll just melt up completely and then you'll find yourself screwed in the middle of the night. Um, the only thing that I'd be interested to try in the future would be the Cenoc reservoirs, just because they're compatible, uh, like the thread on the mouthpiece is compatible with the Sawyer Squeeze filter. So you can actually just thread the Sawyer Squeeze on top of it, post it up on a tree or a trekking pole and let that water gravity filter through it. So you don't actually have to spend time uh, manually squeezing the water through the filter. So that'd be something I'd want to try in the future. But if, again, I'm going into freezing temperatures, you can't pour boiling water into a CNOC bag. Um, and the CNOC bags tend to develop pinholes in them over time. So I think if I'm going to be in cold weather, I'll carry the same Hydropack uh, collapsible water bladder. But if it's going to be super temperate weather, I might invest in a CNOC reservoir just for the additional ease of gravity filtering. The stove that I used was the MSR Pocket Rocket 2. This thing is great. I got no complaints on it. It uh, regulated the flame really well. It was super compact and lightweight, and I didn't really see any other options out there that I liked any better. Um, some of the stoves have a clicker built into it, so you don't need to carry a lighter, which is a cool feature. Um, I wouldn't mind seeing that on a future model of the Pocket Rocket, uh, but definitely not a necessary item because I carry a lighter with me anyway. Uh, so I'm gonna keep using the MSR Pocket Rocket 2 in the future. The cook pot that I used was the Outdoor Anywhere Rubberized Handle Aluminum 2 liter cook pot. So this thing was pretty big. Um, the rubberized handles were a great touch because I saw many other through hikers burn their hands on the handle of their pot. And sometimes like because they burn their hands, they'll react quickly and spill boiling water on them, uh, which is funny enough, one of the most common injuries on the PCT. Um, so that was a really nice touch. The pot itself was definitely like excessively large two liters is totally unnecessary. I just had that pot already um, because when I would go on backpacking trips with Justin, we would both just boil enough water out of that one pot for the two of us. Uh, and I didn't really want to buy a new pot. It didn't seem that necessary. I could fit all of my uh, cook system into that pot, which is really cool. I could fit like my fuel, my stove, my utensils, my rag and my lighter all within that two liter pot. So it was nice to keep it all together. But I do think moving forward, I'll probably invest in a uh, Tokes 750 milliliter uh, titanium pot, just because it's a lot lighter, it's a lot smaller, more compact, and you can still fit the four ounce fuel cans inside of that pot. Um, I think the one that I have now is just totally unnecessary. So in the future, I'd go with the Tokes uh, probably 750 milliliter titanium pot. And I did always carry two Bic mini lighters with me at all times. So I'd keep one in my cook pot, like I mentioned, um, and then I'd keep a backup in a Ziploc with all my first aid stuff, just in case like the other one got wet. Um, I would still keep doing that in the future. Just, it's always good to have a backup, especially if you end up hiking alone. I have a Sea to Summit Alpha Light Spork, uh, the long one. The length of it was really great uh, because I ate out of like food bags a lot, but I found the spork function like totally unnecessary and pretty annoying, honestly, um, because most things that I end up eating were kind of like soupy, so I'd rather just a spoon. I didn't ever have a need for a fork itself, so the spork function didn't really mean anything to me. Um, 
So I would probably go with a spoon in the future. Uh, I still like the long handle of it. And then the other thing that really started to annoy me pretty quickly was uh, that material scraping on the inside of a pot is potentially the worst sound ever in existence. So I would definitely go with the GSI rubber spoon with the long handle in the future. Um, it's really similar design. It's a spoon instead of a spork. Like I mentioned, I rarely ever used the fork function of it. Um, but it's like dipped and coated in a soft rubber. Uh, think like a baking spatula, which is really great because you don't have that terrible sound and you could scrape the inside of your pot and get every last bit of food out of there. Um, so I would definitely go with a GSI rubber spoon in the future. Now I did pick up a Sea to Summit collapsible X cup. Um, I didn't think I was gonna be drinking a ton of like coffee and tea in the morning, but after having to wake up in the Sierras at like 2 a.m. to start all of the snow covered passes, coffee became pretty essential and especially just like something warm to drink in a cold morning became at least like pretty essential to morale. Um, so I did pick that up, I think, when I stopped in the town of Bishop in the Sierras. I'd carry one in the future. I didn't think it was super necessary in the beginning, and it still isn't, but it's really nice to have. Um, and honestly, I ended up using it a lot at nighttime. We'd make like hot chocolates and someone would pack out a tiny flask of whiskey, and it was just really nice to be able to rel relax with people um, and have a drink at the end of the day. So I'd recommend carrying one, especially if you're gonna be either in a social setting or if you're gonna be waking up early in the morning. Like I mentioned, I did eat a lot of my food out of bags. Uh, I hate doing dishes at home, so especially when I'm out like enjoying nature, I don't wanna do any dishes at all if I can avoid it. So most of the time I would get like Knorr packets, um, just the dollar K-N-O-R-R -R packets that you can find at the Walmart or anywhere, the rice and pasta sides come with like the foil lining on the inside of those packets. So you can actually just pour boiling water straight into those bags. Um, things like pasta and couscous, you could just put in a freezer Ziploc bag and pour boiling water into those bags and eat out of there as well. So you can check out my gear introductory video up here where I made a food pouch cozy out of Reflectix, like that uh, sun shield material that you'll put on your car windshield. Um, and I would just put those food bags in there let them soak and kind of retain all of their heat in there and then I just eat out of those bags so I didn't have to do any dishes. I did that for the majority of the trail and I really, really liked it. Uh, I'll keep using that uh, homemade pouch cozy in the future. I did end up getting like so hungry later on in the trail that I started packing out even more food to add into it, like tuna packets, um, fresh onion, sometimes jalapenos, anything that I could get that was like fresh and would like not spoil during that section of hike. Um, I'd end up like cutting up and putting in there. So sometimes my food got too big to actually fit in that pouch cozy. Um, so if you do experience a lot of hung hiker hunger, I'd either recommend making a super big pouch cozy or I ended up just eating out of my pot at the end of the trail. So I think it's fantastic, but if you do like to make big batches of food, it's definitely inconvenient to have to fit all of that in a like predetermined uh, pouch. I carried just a plain cotton bandana as um, my dish rag. There's not much to say about that. I used it, I rinsed it off in streams. Uh, it worked for me. I'd recommend bringing a dish rag. If you wanna bring a microfiber cloth, uh, you could totally do that. It's just gonna get gross anyway, so to me it doesn't really matter. Um, I also brought the scent lock Adam food bag. Now this bag was marketed as being scent proof. Um, it's supposed to be used for like hunters uh, so they don't leave the trail. Definitely was not scent proof according to the squirrel that chewed through it about mile 300. Um, but it was still a fantastic bag. Uh, it was a great shape to fit in my pack in particular. It tended to be a little bit like narrower and longer. Um, I really liked how it worked for me. I would use it again for sure. Just don't count on it being scent proof because it was not scent proof. And lastly, I carried with me a spice rack. Um, it was just like three small plastic containers with a couple different spices and a tiny uh, refillable like 
travel size shampoo bottle filled with sriracha and I would have 100 percent do that again because the wait is totally worth it. Um, I would refill sriracha every single time I got into town and don't let anyone tell you that that's too much weight. Uh, you want to look forward to having a good meal at the end of the day, especially when you're pushing those big miles and that's what you have to look forward to. So that wraps up all of my cook system. Um, again, if y'all have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll try to respond to all of those. But be on the lookout next week. I'll be coming out with my second video in the series of three. And again, that one's gonna be on my clothing, it's gonna be on my electronics, and it's gonna be on my pack. So until then, I'll see y'all later and happy trails.